Hey guys, Akil Mahudin here. Welcome back to another video. So today we're going to be continuing on with our RAM module. And in the last video we had, I think, one byte of RAM, uh, maybe two bytes of RAM that we could actually use functionally. And obviously a real computer is way more than two bytes of RAM or two bytes of cache. So we're going to learn how we can make more of that. And we didn't really go over the issues of making more than one byte of RAM. So that's what we're going to address right now in this video. So this is basically what we had before. We had um, our eight cells, which is our eight bits, and then we had a write line and then a read line. And then depending on whether we wanted to write or we wanted to read, we could manipulate the bytes as such. Now I'm not going to go over exactly how we did this because we did that in the last video or the video before that. So you can go ahead and watch those if you need a refresher. So what happens if we create another byte? So, if we create a second byte, or even a third byte, then if we put the same write line and the same read line into these bytes, then we have a problem. Because now, we are manipulating both of these bytes as if they are one byte of RAM, just a 16-bit byte of RAM. And that's a problem. And more importantly, it's going to copy the same data into both of these uh, bytes. And when we read, we're going to be pushing two different uh, Data's onto the same bus, and we learned earlier how that's a problem. So, how do we fix this? Right. So the solution is to have an address before the write and before uh, the read on each one, and then an AND gate. So basically, it's like think of it as a switch. So we flip the switch on this first byte, which means that yes, we want to talk to this first byte, and then we say whether we want to read or we want to write. And then we can do the same for the second bit. So we can say, we can flip the switch for the second bit and say, yes, I'm interacting with the second byte right now, and I want to write or I want to read right now for the second byte. This way we can choose which one to interact with on like an individual, individual level. And we do this with an address. So when the address is 0000, zero, zero, zero so four zeros, right, the first address, then we're interacting with this one. When the address is 0001, or the first, uh, the second address, then we're interacting with this byte. Okay, And it's important to note that you can actually connect all these writes together and all these reads together. So if you have, say, 16 bytes of memory, which is exactly what you can have, that's a maximum, because for this address, you can have a maximum of 16 bytes. If you connect all the writes and the reads together, it won't matter, because even if you connect all the writes and all the reads together, you can still only interact with one because of this AND gate right here that says the address is choosing which one we want to interact with, not the write or the read is choosing which one we want to interact with. So it's important to note that. So how do we create a circuit like this? So this is the next question. How do we create a circuit that essentially has four inputs 16 outputs because there's 16 possible options and only one of those outputs is high at a single time That's what we want only one output is high or only one output is low and then we can just negate everything um, But the important thing is that only one output is different from the rest of the outputs at one time How do you create a circuit like that? Okay, so here is the circuit right here now, this is only scaled for two, because it's much easier to think with uh, the small numbers. So, here we go. We want something that's high when it's, the inputs are zero, zero. So the answer for that would be a NOR gate. Because if you remember, the truth table for a NOR gate, it's only high when both inputs are zero, zero. So, there you go. You put a NOR gate between these. Now, how about one for one, zero? Well, for one zero, we could do an XOR gate, because an XOR gate is high when only one of the inputs is high. And that means that zero zero, if the input's zero zero, then it'll be low. Or if the input's one one, then it'll be low also. So now we know that only one of these inputs is high if this XOR gate is true. So then we can put an AND gate before, say, the B value or the A value to determine which one of those inputs is high. So the XOR gate tells us that one input is high. Then we put an AND gate before and with the B value, and it says if the AND gate's true, that means B is true and only one input is true. So B is true and only B is true. Or we could put it in front of the A, the AND gate with the A value. So now this means only one input is true, and that input is A. And these are fairly simple circuits. I'm sure you can figure out how this and where this is going. Um, so this is just a basis. Now, obviously, for 1, 1, 
it would be um, an AND gate. That would tell us that both of them are true. Here it is. The decoder chip. Four inputs, 16 outputs. So taking a look at the data table for this chip, we can see the pinout over here, and then we can see the truth table over here. Now, G1 and G2, I think these are sort of just like enabled chips. So if one, either G1 or G2 is uh, connected high, then uh, the decoder just doesn't work anymore at all. Um, so we're going to be tying G1 and G2 to low when we use it. But as you can see, we can see that uh, how the input is going to work right here. And if we want to take, go ahead and take a look at the logic diagram. Okay, so the logic diagram is right here. And as you can see, it's very different from the one that we designed on our piece of paper. Okay, so here's the one that we created for the first four bits. Now, it, obviously this is for 16, so it's going to be different. But it doesn't even use any of these gates that we specified out here, XOR or... Uh, the XOR and AND combo. All it's using here is NAND gates and NOT gates. And now this is a way you can do it. So this just proves how in digital electronics there's multiple ways to get the same job done. And what they do here is they're inverting and reinverting and then either using the inverted copy or the reinverted copy and they're using actually four input NAND gates. So I know that all the NAND gates we've been using have been two input NAND gates but there are NAND gates out there that are four input NAND gates. And so that's what they're using here to basically specify the output. So we can go through exactly how this is, but obviously this is a complicated uh, logic diagram and it's really not worth your time because you already understand the basic concept of it and whether you make it like this or you make it like this really has no difference to us. As you guys can see, I've built the circuit right here and as you can also tell, there's not 16 LEDs out here, not 16 outputs. And that's merely because I couldn't fit all 16 outputs here. And we really don't need to see all 16 to get the basic idea. So I'm just going to show you the first seven. Um, so let's go ahead and plug this in and give it some power. Okay, so here we go. Now, it's nice to note that all of these are inverted outputs. So the LED that actually won't be on is technically the LED that's high. Because remember, it's not really which one's high and which one's low. It's really a matter of which one's unique. So which one's different from the rest of them. And as you can see, with an address of 000, the first LED's on. Or, I mean, the first LED's off. The first one's unique. And so we can go ahead and change this to uh, second, second LED. And then third, so this is a value of two, value of three, get the fourth LED, and then next one, get the fifth LED. So we can keep go ahead and doing this and keep going down the line, but I think that you guys basically get the point that only one output is on at a time. And that's really the most important thing to get away from this. All right, so going back to the beginning, uh, we now have the way to store an address. I mean, not store an address, but to, like, address an address to talk to each of these bytes individually, right? So now we just need to connect a register with an AND gate to the write and the read to this address. So now that we can actually interact with each of the bytes individually. And luckily, we don't have to do this with all 16 bytes because there is actually a chip that will do this for us. Here it is. It is a 64-bit RAM chip, um, 4 bytes, 4 addresses. So here's the data sheet for the chip and we can see from the data sheet that we have our 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, outputs, so that's the data out. Then we have our 1, 2, 3, 4 data inputs, so that's the data that we're going to want to load. And then we have these four other positions, which is A0, A1, A2, and A3. And these stand for addresses. So this actually has 64 bits of random access memory, and it's actually split up into uh, bytes of four bits each. So it's actually 16 bytes of four bits. So with a four uh, bit address, you can access all 16 of those options. So this is how these four is going to be your output, basically. Uh, pins 5, 7, uh, 9, and 11 are going to be your output for whatever byte of RAM that you're accessing based on whatever address you put in. And then to load data, you're going to want to put uh, whatever data you're trying to load on pins 4, 6, 
10, and 12. And then once you want to write, uh, you're going to put this WE. Now WE is actually an active low. And WE is for the writing. So that's like the enable chip that we saw in the register before where we would enable it to write to the register. Same idea here. Then chip select is going to be for the output. And we're basically going to tie that one low because, again, low means active. So the chip select we're just going to always tie because we're going to have the data going into a frame buffer and then that's going to control whether it goes onto the bus or not and we're doing that remember because we want to be able to see the contents of the memory before it goes onto the bus this way it helps us with troubleshooting and such now i know it's an extra step but it'll help us in the long run so that's basically it for here so now we can go ahead and take a look oh wait um actually one more thing the outputs are all inverse. The data is not inverse, so you don't have to worry about inverting whatever contents you're trying to put onto the chip, but the outputs are inverse. That's something to remember. Alright guys, so here's the actual completed circuit right here, and this is for 8 bits with our 4-bit address, our, uh, our right, let me tie that high right now, and then our 8-bit data. So let's go ahead and plug this in. And we can go ahead and take a look. Now, it's not connected to a bus or anything yet, but we'll get to that later. Next step of the process, I think I'll separate this video, um, but the next step of the process will actually be making uh, another section where we can set, we can choose between setting the address uh, by hand or we can let the CPU set the address itself. Because, you know, in a normal CPU, you don't go around setting memory addresses every single time your CPU wants to do a function. Rather, it takes care of it itself. But in the beginning programming of our CPU, because we don't have a uh, storage option that remains after power is lost, like a hard drive or an SSD, we need to reprogram the program that we're trying to run into the CPU every single time we start it up again. So we're going to need a way to actually program the CPU with memory addresses physically and then after that we can set it on like a run mode where it will run it itself. So, here we go. Um, as you can see there's something random in memory right now. We're at memory address 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, now I have this set to all zeros I believe. So we can go ahead and write that. Oh no, looks like we have one one. Oh yes, right here. The last, uh, the fourth bit. So now we have all zeros. Let's go ahead and write that. And yep looks good so well, now we have all zeros in the f in the first memory address let's move on to the second memory address so this is actually address uh, 0001 um, but we're calling it uh, the second address because technically the first address is zero and so here we go um, something random in memory now I'm gonna set this to the value of one so seven zeros and one one and let's write that there we go Oh, by the way, these are the first four bits, these are the last four bits, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, 6, 7, 8, just like that. So, this looks good. Um, Alright, so let's move on to address number 3. So, here we go, something random, looks like we got all 1's here, so let's set it to, I'm setting right now the data to be exactly what the memory address is, so let's set it to 2. And go ahead and where's the right? Here it is. And we'll write that. And here we go. All right, so we're good. So now let's go back to the first address, address zero. Okay, just like that. And we have our zero. Let's go to the second address, address one. And we have our one. Let's go back to the third address, address number two. And we have our two. There we go. So now we know we can set whatever value data that we want in this. So this is actually a working component that we can go ahead and set inside the CPU if we want to right now. But of course, there's still a little bit more that needs to be done, just as always, and we will get to that later in the next video.